Hi everyone. In 2017, I was the creative director for the Sea Games. After a lifetime of watching the Olympic Games ceremonies, being the creative director of the Sea Games was a major dream come true for me. How did something so momentous happen to me? It's a major dream, right? And doing the Sea Games is not for everyone. I got the year before I had a, I received a phone call from a man I met once five years before then. He invited me to be part of the team to pitch for the Sea Games. I said yes. We pitched, we won, and I was the creative director of the Sea Games. A man I met once five years ago. Randomness. These are my parents. They were match made. They never met met each other until their wedding day, and considering that they were strangers at 21, 21 years old and 20 years old when they first married, I think they did reasonably well. They went on to have six children. Hang on, huh? Um, sorry, I only have a picture of five. The first four, ah, uh, first four siblings. The fifth one wasn't in the picture yet. On the far right, on the far right is number one, my elder sister. She is one year older than number two, my second sister, who is in turn two years older than number three, my eldest brother, and he is one year older than number four, my second brother, and number four is actually two years older than number five. You are surprised, right? Anyone who watched the film would think that I only had one brother and one sister, but actually there are six of us. And I'm number six, and number six is eight years younger than number five, who's not in the picture. Yes, I'm an accident. <laughs> Randomness. Yeah. This is me outside our ancestral home at High Key Sin Law, Victoria Street. Uh, for those of you who are not Hokkien, so as you can see, I was a very like a good boy, very studious, and very tiawa. I would literally wear anything my mother gave me. <laughs> yeah. So I was also the only child born after my father went bankrupt. Yeah. I was his favorite child. Although my brothers and sisters each had one maid, they they remember my father as being distant and absent and bad tempered. But I, on the other hand, had really fond memories of my father. Every Sunday, my father would take me to the movies, just him and I, no one else. We would watch any movie that was playing. When he had a little bit of money, we would watch a movie and I'll get ice cream. When he had a bit more money, we watched two movies in a row and I'll get ice cream. I mean, looking back. We none of us. I don't think not, uh, my father or I at that point would have realized that this one day that I could end up being in the film industry. I mean, it was the 60s and 70s, and also given our family circumstances, that would be almost impossible. I, I suppose go back first. Sorry. Okay. So basically, my universe was. Family, films, and school. I was actually a goody goody um, film loving nerd boy. Yeah, so that was my world. And then came Form Six. Form Six was co-ed time, co-ed time, and nerd boy me ended up sitting behind the orientation queen. She was the most popular girl in the school. I mean, completely random because you know we didn't. We just ended up like that. One day she turned around to me and looked at me intently and reached over and took off my thick glasses. And she said, "You're not so ugly." <laughs> I was shocked, so I laughed nervously, and um, therein started a great, great friendship. There she is, Bridget. Yeah, she literally changed my world. She was the first person to take an active interest in me. 
she taught me, she took me to the shops to buy my own clothes, taught me how to dress. She taught me how to be socially not awkward, I guess. And she even made me do part-time waitering to make money to buy, to afford contact lenses. And most importantly, she took me disco dancing. <laughs> yeah, discos, not clubs. And the great thing about it is that we did all this while I was riding Pilan on her motorbike. <laughs> She's a great girl. Yeah. The most important thing she did for me, however, was that she pushed me to go to Singapore. I had been accepted by National University of Singapore to read double physics and math, but my family couldn't afford to send me. So she said, why don't you reach out to your rich relatives, apply for scholarships, and just make sure you go, make sure you get out of this place. We, I mean, we were youngsters, and I mean, the world was out there, and we wanted to see it. I did, I managed to get a scholarship, and off I went to Singapore. This is Shears Hall, the host, on-campus hostel where I stayed in, in Singapore. First time living an, away from home, Newly comfortable in my own skin. Of course, the inevitable happened. I went berserk. I just went out partying all the time. Partied really, really hard. Skipped all lessons. Only attending the bare minimum to be able to sit for the exams. Of course, what happened was, first year fail, first year repeat. Second year fail, second year repeat. I mean, to be fair to me, Quite early on, I recognized that double physics and math was not for me and I wanted to quit. But my mother reminded me that I was the only child to attend university. So no choice. So I had to stay on. So imagine the shame when I failed my second year repeat and I was thrown out of Singapore. I the worst thing about that situation was that my parents were so nice about it. I mean, both my mom and dad said to me, don't worry, you tried your best, come home. I know I didn't try my best. So, so I did what a brave son would do. I went to KL. And uh, I just, just for the life of me, couldn't go back to Penang to face them. Yeah? I arrived from Singapore in KL with 10 ringgit in my pocket. Called up an old Penang friend, called up an old Penang friend to, to bunk in her, what do you call, couch. Her couch, for two, uh, she allowed me to stay in a, her house sharing couch for two nights. So one friend led to another, one couch led to another and that kept me going a little bit. Of course, during that time, I was looking for, I was looking for money. I had to survive, right? So I was cast in a TV commercial. I made... Eh, sorry, yeah? Oh, I was supposed to be at this. I made... I, made, um, I was a really terrible model in the mid, uh, TV commercial, but I enjoyed the process so much. This is what I'm describing here is the image, the, the rock bottom. Yeah, but... And... I decided maybe this is what I can do. Advertising, because it's quite easy. You know, everybody's having fun and everybody's very nice and all that. So I, what I did is I went to the yellow pages, looked under advertising and started calling people from A. No one would see me until I got to O. Ogilvy and Mehta. Farida Marikan was the head of AV at Ogilvy and Mehta and she kindly said, come in and chat. I went in to see her, we chatted, we had a really good interview. At the end of it, she looked at me and said, I don't have a job for you. Of course it was, oh, I thought we did really well. And she said, but please call Joe Hashem. Joe Hashem was then her boyfriend, um, now husband, who had, who had a production company. So I went to see Joe Hashem, and Joe Hashem asked me just one question. Why should, we hi why should I hire you? And I said, because I'm good. He laughed and I got a job. <laughs> so it worked. 
and there started my life in film production. Okay, I mean, I started as a lowly production assistant. We kind of sweep the floor, make coffee, carry the lights. We did everything, casting, uh, location scouting, wardrobe styling, everything, because those were the days when it's not so specialized, you know. But you know what? Though the hours were long and the money was bad, I was deliriously happy. I found my groove. This is my passion. I found it finally. And you know, when you when you are happy, you work really well. So. In three short months, not years, uh, months, Joe Hashem made me a producer. It's pretty amazing. So I became a producer and then I went on to other things as well. I became like joined advertising agency, set up a post production company, and eventually opened my own company, my own production house. And my own production house was operating in Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia and we did really, really well. All the things we did was like successful. It was a golden period for, for TV commercials then. But then I got bored. And my business partner at that time, my, the film director, uh, I was his producer, said to me, you like telling me what to do all the time. Why don't you start directing? And I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> like Paul, I'm a bit like, yeah. <laughs> That's where the directing stage started. I called up randomly, I called up EMI Music because I want to do music videos like a way of building my show reel and all that. So I called up EMI Music and I say, hey, I'm looking for TV uh, music videos to do. Do you have any I can do for you? And guess what? The person on the other, uh, at the other end of the line said to me, actually we are. And he asked me to go in, I went in, and that led to my doing KRU Fanatics video. KRU Fanatics video was my very first directing job. And it was a tremendous experience in that it won every award in Malaysia, and it went to New York MTV finals for the Asia category, the first outing. And of course, after this, I, was, I became really busy directing TV commercials and music videos locally and internationally. Random call, great result. And then, I got bored again. I don't know, I mean there's something about me that I, I don't know, an instinct or compulsion to, to keep challenging myself or keep improving. I got bored again and I thought, what is it that I want? that I really, really want? And the answer was movies. I thought, hey, since I had so much success in this field, how hard can it be, right? And also, since I was so busy with TV commercials and music videos all the time, I didn't have any time to focus on films. So essentially, I quit a very, very successful gig to focus all my energies on films. I knocked on every door. I traveled around the world to all the international film festivals on my own steam. And I didn't make any headway for two years. Soon I was running out of money and I decided, I think I should go back to TV commercials before I staff. So I did one last thing. I called Othman Hafsham. He was a very famous film director in the 80s. And he was very kind and helpful to me when I was trying to find my way in the film industry. So I called him to book up Wasa with him as a kind of thank you to him uh, for helping me. So while driving to meet Ofman Hasham, my phone rang. It was Tiara. I mean, Tiara I've known nominally because socially we bump into each other when we, when we go out and all that. So she called me and she said, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm on the way to dinner. She said, no, cancel your dinner and come have dinner with me. <laughs> Bad mood ready, right? Because depressed, have to go back to commercial. I said, no lah. But she was very insistent. So I said, okay, I tell you what, after my dinner, I'll call you. Right? So I got, her, I got off the hook. I went to meet Hafsham, thanked him and said, hey, I'm going to go back to directing TV commercials. Thank you very much. 
and I drove home. Of course, I wasn't going to call Tiara because I was really de depressed already, right? My phone rang again. She, uh, it was Tiara, and she said, where are you? I said, I'm actually at the traffic lights in, fr in front of my apartment already. Why don't we meet another time? I said. And she said, oh, no, 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 it's great. We are at the cafe ne near the traffic light next to your apartment. <laughs> okay, I don't have to keep repeating, but you get a random pattern. How it like just everything just kind of like randomly happened and forced me into a situation. I thought, okay lah, no choice. I drove. I went to the cafe, sat with her. Bad mood still, because I didn't know what nah. She wanted to do a movie, so they were talk. We were just talking, talking. There were two other people there. And she said, hey, what do you know about the Putri Gunung Ledang story? Oh, I said, oh, I think it's a terrible story. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, why? I said, you don't know why she rejected the king, and you don't know why she went the mountain, and you don't know why she, what happened to her in the end. Oh, silly. She, then she looked at me and she said, I'm going to make a Putri Gunung Ledang film. <laughs> I thought, fish. <laughs> I kind of put my foot in it really. So <laughs> she passed me the script. I thought, oh, bloody hell, bloody hell. I went home. <laughs> I went home. I read the script that night itself. And after I finished reading the script, I didn't like the script, to be honest. Uh, the first draft script, I didn't like it. But it had a very good core idea of this fictional love story between uh, Putri Gunung Ledang and Hang Toa and the king. That was the central conceit of the script. So I sat down and I wrote a very long treatment detailing what I would actually do if I were the director of this film. It's very brave. We all, obviously, I've never directed a film before in my life and there is, she is, Tiara, she is like acted in films and all that, got money, produced, and I am telling her this is wrong, you know? But, you know, as much as I wanted it, I felt it was only right if I did that if I was fair to myself. Because the script as it was, I wouldn't be able to do it and I don't want to just do it to take the money, you know? So I finished about four or five in the morning writing the thing. I faxed it over to her. Yes, fax. <laughs> faxed it over to her and went to sleep. And then the next morning, quite early, I think about nine like that, I got a phone call. Tiara's producer called me and she said, did you send a fax to Tiara last night? <laughs> I thought, yes, I did. He said, you're very brave, she said. I said, yeah, but I feel strongly about it. He said, thank God she loves it. I'm on. So that led me to Putri Gunung Ledang. As it turns out, the production for Putri Gunung Ledang was the toughest, most challenging thing ever I've encountered, until now actually, is the toughest, 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 toughest. Thankfully, we persevered and got through it. And thankfully, the film ended up being a benchmark film. Putri Gurung Ledang, as you may not know, may, may know, is the first Malaysian film invited to the Venice International Film Festival. It was also the first Malaysian film sub submitted for Academy Awards consideration. I mean, all the pain was suddenly worth it. We were kind of like, at Venice International Film Festival, we were kind of like rock stars. From like zero, cannot get a film, to doing a terrible, terrible uh, production. Was so challenging. Challenging actually, to be, I want to qualify it. It's challenging for obvious reasons because uh, Malaysia at that point had never done a film of so big a scale. And we have never done, built a palace before. We have never built a harbour. We have never done computer graphics in Malaysia, you know. So we were doing all the things that never been done and really we just barely made it. So anyway, in Venice, we were like rock stars. We were fettered everywhere and, you know, uh, crowds cheering us and, and, and things like that. And especially the arrival, when you get to Venice, the really interesting thing is that you, are, you come on a boat and you get off the boat and you're announced and all that and all that. So, before our arrival was Johnny Depp, and then it was us. After us was Tom Cruise. <laughs> and when we were walking on the streets and on, on the, uh, the, the piazzas and all that, you could see 
Meryl Streep, Kong Lee, Steven Spielberg. So it was like my bloody film magazine come alive. <laughs> so enough already, I'm very happy. Yeah. But what followed Putri Gunung Ledang was what I call my fellow period, a down period. Although I went on to make another film and although I won awards and all that, I was kind of stuck in a rut. And I wasn't the only one who knew I was stuck in a rut. Hey. Mi Fang. She was previously with Astro and she has her own production company. I kind of know her, familiar with her, but I don't, she's not a friend. One day out of the blue, she calls me. And she says, hey, Tiong Hin, how are you? I say, hi, Mi Fang, I'm good. And she says, would you mind if I brought a feng shui man to your house? <laughs> I go like, huh? I said, why do you want to do that? She said, I don't know. You should be more successful, but you're not. She said, very blunt girl. I mean, I love that. She said, but you're not. And I thought it might be something to do with a house. So can I bring a feng shui man? The second thing for me was, because I wasn't doing it that great, how much does it cost? She said, don't worry, it's my treat. So she sent this feng shui man over to my house, unsolicited, right? Feng shui man looked around and said, I have to move immediately. My front entrance, my, my entrance door was in my conflict area and my toilet is my wealth sector. <laughs> no wonder. So I had to move, but I didn't have the resources to move. I didn't have the money to move, to rent a house or something while I tried to sell the apartment or what. I didn't have the resources. And her company, Mi Fang's company, advanced me uh, money to move. I moved and then something miraculous happened. I went into the most productive uh, period of my career. I directed a TV, uh, TV series. I did a couple of movies. I even directed a stage musical uh, tribute to Sudirman, uh, the late Sudirman at uh, Istana Budaya. And most importantly, the new relationship, new professional relationship that formed was Josie Day called me. Say, hey, Tiong Hin, I'm going to be the festival director of Georgetown Festival. What's that? You know, because at that time we didn't know much. She said, oh, it's an arts festival. Do you have anything you want to do? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't I do Emily of Emerald Hill? But with the, instead of one, Emily, Emily is a monodrama, one, one woman play. But I, what I did is I took the three most famous Emilies and cast them in the same play. One taking the young, one taking the middle age, and one taking the old. And so that kind of like set me up. It was a tremendous success for Georgetown Festival and for myself. And then I became like taken seriously as a theatre director. I went on to also do uh, Silat with Joe. Um, it was a dance drama about Tua and Jabat. And it was done at Open Air in Fort Cornwallis. And in both instances, it was a huge risk because open air la, you go and do like dinner theatre la, you know, like for the Emily one, we recreated the whole town hall like as though it's her house. So you come in, there's a cocktail party going on and then everybody goes upstairs and then the play happens as they eat dinner. So it was a major undertaking. So anyway, the apex of our collaboration was actually this. High Case in Law, the play. So it was 2014. Joe called me and said, hey, this year you're not submitting any proposals for, for Georgetown Festival. I said, actually, no, I didn't, I didn't think of it. He said, don't you have anything you want to do? So I thought, yeah, actually I do. I said, do you, how, uh, are you open to a Hokkien play? I said, oh, great, that's a good idea, let's do it. So I dug out this old film script, Hokkien film script for my drawer. <laughs> Something I wrote like five years ago, before then. And I could never get it made because nobody would give me the money uh, to do it. And I converted that into a theatre script. I staged it at Kuh Kong si, And the process was very painful to say the least. What I, as I was telling you my life journey through all the highs and even lows of my career, I've kind of skipped out the uh, personal bits and 
I think anyone who has seen the film will know what the personal uh, bits were, and it, w it was quite a dysfunctional family in in a sense. So I wanted closure, and and by that stage, my mom had passed away. So this film script that I did was kind of like an apology to her because I believe I was unfair to her when she was alive. Uh, I was just a very angry young man, and now that she's dead, how do you apologize publicly? You know, but publicly. So I decided to make a film, but I could, could never get it made. And this was an opportunity for me to express this, how sorry I was to her, you know. The production was crazy. The eve of the performance day, the, it was at the Ku Kong Si in the open. There was a huge thunderstorm. A lightning hit the rooftop of the Kukong Sea and send down shards uh, to the ground, flying to the ground. The shards broke the back window of a car and even cut one of the technicians. And the storm was so big, the front of the stage had a projection screen that we projected images on. Brought down the whole uh, projection screen. We couldn't finish our tech. I mean, and, and you know, tech is very important. You spot where the lights are, where everybody will stand, the micro level of their microphones when they are screaming or crying or whatever. And we had to abandon it. The next day, of course, we gathered. And we were all working very diligently. Art department was sewing up the screens. The technicians were trying to balance the mics, you know. And the lighting guys put things in the daylight. How do you balance light, you know? But they tried, they just did. But it was absolute silence. You could hear a pin drop because I think everybody knew we were on the brink of disaster. Like, no tech, ma. and you open in like 8.30. At 6.30, we were still sewing, still sewing the screen. So anyway, no choice, the show must go on. 8.30, the show starts. And thank God everything just miraculously worked and it was a very tremendous um, performance and production very 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 well received the best of my career and from there i was given the money to do this what i've always meant was meant to do through a series of unrelated random events i got to do High Kiss in Law, the play, and then which led me to High Kiss in Law, the film. So I would like to just say, at this point, say this. I want to say thank you to my family and to everyone, every, every kind soul who has ever helped me along on my life's journey. And I want to say this to all of you. Believe in yourself. Just always try your best. Trust in the randomness of the universe. And finally, just trust the universe. It will look after you. Thank you.